This is a video about N116 Bravo Whiskey, an experimental aircraft. It was not built by Cessna or Piper or any manufacturer of certificated airplanes. It was built by me in a hangar at Reed Hill View Airport over a period of five years and 2,360 hours of logged builder time. I am one of approximately 30,000 individuals in the United States who have built and flown their own aircraft. In the fall of 1996, I found myself bored with renting aircraft for a $100 hamburger flight to a local airport. Like most private pilots, after the initial excitement of flying wore off, and after visiting every airport on the map, I was either going to own my own airplane or give up aviation. That decision was no small thing, as hidden costs of owning an aircraft abound. The cost of a new aircraft alone could easily be one hundred and sixty to two hundred thousand dollars. A way to spend a lot less and have my own exciting aircraft was to build it myself. Was I thinking about five years of my life and fifty thousand dollars? Probably not. In January of 1997, I started my journey. Like most journeys, it started small, a call and a trip to visit Vans Aircraft in Aurora, Oregon. I took their $50,000 test drive and chose an RV-6A, a low-wing, two-seater, side-by-side aluminum airplane. It was a kit plane, so many of the hard-to-produce parts, like the engine mount, were supplied by vans. In placing the order, I walked through a door to a new life, consumed by learning how to rivet, what prop to use, and where to get an engine, and the thousands of unknowns that would need to be known before N. 116 Bravo Whiskey would fly, and I would do it completely alone, using only approximately eight hours of help to rivet a few places that I could not buck myself. This photo journal covers my five-year journey with pictures and description. I hope it represents more than a builder's log. It's a builder's dream to take flight. Empennage the first kit is the horizontal and vertical stabilizer, along with the hinged elevators and rudder. For the first time kit builder, it's a terrifying experience. Placing correctly the first of 13,000 rivets required to build the airplane. It's a sink or swim proposition. All the basic skills are represented in this assembly. One quickly learns that it does not need to be perfect, just mostly perfect. The first surprise is how thin and light weight the aluminum parts are. The aluminum skin creates the strength, the ribs merely define the shape. Builders use air tools because they are faster and do not overheat. The rivets on the outer surface of the airplane are flush, they don't protrude. Therefore every hole in the skin has to be deburred and dimpled. The small pins you see in photographs are called clicos. They hold the pieces together until a rivet is set. In the afternoon of January 1st, 1997, my journey began. My first task on January 8th was to bring the FedEx box to my garage. It had been delivered to my next door neighbor. January 15th, worked on the HS609PP. Rounded ends, polished entire bar, two-thirds done. January 16th, Finished HS609PP. Wing kit. Eight months later, on September 3rd, 1997, the wing kit arrived. It was a very large box that included the pre-built wing spar. I paid extra for the kit maker to build the spar. I wanted to be sure the airplane was as strong as possible, and I wasn't sure I could set the large rivets that were required. When completed, these wings weigh only a few hundred pounds, but they would support a force of plus 6G and minus 3G. I was now working at Reed Hill View Airport in a shared hangar. It would be three more years until the wings and other pieces of the airplane would leave Reed Hill View for that first flight at Salinas, California. Unpacking the spars and skin, my mind wasn't thinking about a finished airplane. I was thinking about how to build the jig that would be required to ensure the wings were built true. I became a one-man manufacturing factory using techniques to work with aluminum that were developed before World War II. If Rosie the Riveter could do it, so could I. October 16th, 
deburred all holes in main and forward ribs. Rear spar, including machine dimpling and support angles. Next, deburr edges. October 20th, use die grinder, scotch bright wheel on all left wing ribs and angles. Fuel tanks. In January 1998, after three months of wing construction, I started assembly of the two wing mounted fuel tanks. Each tank holds 19 gallons of 100 low lead aviation fuel, giving the plane about four hours of flying time before the requirement to land and refuel. The old pilot adage about filling the tank and emptying the bladder was part of the design. The tanks are removable parts of the wing, built with the same construction method as the wing, but sealed with rivet holes to contain the fuel. It's called a wet wing. When done well, it's lightweight and effective. Doing it right is the challenge. A special epoxy called ProSeal, impervious to gasoline, is applied to each rivet and hole before it is set. The material is a gooey black called Black Death by the builders. It's a mess and gets everywhere it shouldn't, such as tools and clothing. I was very pleased when it was over, it took about a month and a half to complete, and when it was proven airtight, when I pressure tested it with an inflated balloon. I had no engine, but I had 38 gallons of aviation fuel. Fuselage. I started the fuselage, one of the most demanding parts of the airplane's construction, on October 1st, 1998. More recent versions of this airplane, which are the RV-7 and 7A, are provided with parts match drilled with pilot holes for each rivet. This new version takes about a thousand hours less of assembly time. Back then, I was provided some long pieces of angle stock and several rolls of aluminum sheeting. The bending, jigging, and placement of the skin was up to me. In the first step, the shape of the fuselage was created by clamping the aluminum angle in a vise and bending it. Given the length of the fuse and the number of bulkheads, the opportunity for twists and misalignment were everywhere. In its early stages, it resembled an aluminum canoe. The place where I would sit, the cockpit, was now defined and taking shape. I mistakenly thought I would be finished soon. October 1st, Fab F6122 and angle braces drilled most of the firewall. October 2nd, finished drilling firewall, drilled brake line 61222 bracket and braces, rounded bottom edges of forward part. October 15th. Deburred and smoothed most firewall parts. Not done. Need dimpling? Engine. N116 Bravo Whiskey isn't a glider. It needs thrust in the form of a gasoline engine and a propeller. For me, that meant buying a Lycoming aircraft engine. Some builders have used automobile engines and made them work, eventually. I wanted something proven and reliable. A Lycoming O360A1A. Today, with used or rebuilt Lycomings almost impossible to find, a new engine will cost about $22,000, the cost of a complete automobile. Why? It's a tough question. The simple answer is, the engine is based on pre-World War II technology with little changes. It drinks gas like it's still a dollar a gallon, but it can run for 2,000 hours at 75% power and get you back to the airport for the landing every time. Back then, I found a rebuilt engine from Sport Aviation for $14,000. It was a steal. I had new jugs, meaning cylinders, new mags, or magnetos, new fuel pump, new oil pump, and a new Skytech low-weight starter, and a rebuilt carburetor that looked like something your great-grandfather turned in for scrap value. It was capable of driving a constant-speed propeller, but I instead chose a fixed-pitch propeller. Maybe later for that. Next, I had all that wiring and plumbing to do. Any single failure on anything I did from here on would prevent that wonderful engine from getting me back home. Not surprisingly, the assembly manual from Vans was no help on this subject. Finishing. In January 2001, I could sit in what appeared to be a nearly finished airplane. The finishing kit was a beetle-sized box containing one of the biggest challenges for a builder fitting the plexiglass canopy. One slip of the die grinder and it was a thousand dollar start over 
with no guarantees it wouldn't happen again. Or using one steel pooled rivet instead of the required aluminum pop rivets would shatter the canopy. I checked every rivet with a magnet. The one area of the airplane that never gave me concern, the wiring, soon grew to be a tangle of wires that I put happily in place with no wiring diagram. Hey, I'm an electrical engineer. That's what I do. The engine cowl was another area of laborious fitting and refitting. The appearance, not to mention the safety, of the airplane would be determined by how well these parts fit. They did. Somewhere along the journey I knew I would finish, I had come too far to stop. N116 Bravo Whiskey was going to leave this earth. I just knew it. In August 2001, and my long journey in the home stretch, the engine is ready to start. My hangar bum friends are nearby with fire extinguishers at the ready. I've hand propped the engine until I read oil pressure. Give it a little prime, set mixture full rich, magnetos to on, and now I turn the key to the next position, start. In two blades of the prop movement, the engine starts. It's a loud noise, a very loud noise. I glance at the oil pressure, it's okay, then break into a big grin. I can't hear it, but my friends are applauding. Soon it will be inspected by the FAA. Robin Reed will do a few high-speed taxi tests at Reed Hillview, and I will take the wings off a zillion hard-to-reach bolts and take the plane to Salinas for the first flight. When I followed the trailer to Salinas, my heart was in my throat. What if it flies off the trailer? And why is my friend driving 80 mile an hour with my airplane on a trailer? If it had wings, 65 would be enough for it to fly. First flight. Birds and airplanes have to have a first flight. It can't be avoided because until then, it's just a bunch of aluminum pieces, not a real airplane. After sign off by the FAA inspector, he checked if I had safety wired the prop bolts and the trip to Salinas and the reassembly on a misty day in September 2001, Robin Reed performed a high-speed taxi test, then taxied back to the takeoff into the runway, gave it full throttle, and launched N116 Bravo Whiskey for the first time. He flew about an hour, landed, and we re-indexed the prop to reduce some engine vibration. He flew again for a half an hour, and after a picture, a handshake, he left. A few days later, with no one around, I sat in the run-up area of Salinas, did my pre-flight checks, paused for a moment of reflection, asked for permission to take off, and left the airport in my N116 Bravo Whiskey. It had taken flight. The only other choice was to taxi back to the hangar. I had gone too far for that. N116 Bravo Whiskey is still flying in Jackson, California. I sold her in 2006. How could I sell my child? It was a tough decision. We had flown over 200 hours to places like Salt Lake City and Palm Springs. And now, being in retirement with much less income, the airport hangar fees, insurance, and gasoline prices were simply not sustainable. An airplane is like a racehorse. It has to be flown, and flown hard. It was built for that. Sitting in the hangar is the worst thing for any airplane. After a tearful last flight, I handed over the keys to a person from Jackson, California. He was a friend of the man who first drove my airplane on her perilous journey from Reed Hillview to Salinas Airport. I knew she would have a good home and that was important to me. I still think about her. I know the mag timing was just a little bit off. The direction and attitude gyros were inexpensive. Are they still working? Is she being maintained the way I would? I think so. She will always be my baby. How do I know that? The FAA website says so. That's one bad cat, Harry.